All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Jones, and I would like to welcome you all to the uh, Duke University, D uh, Duke and DC's panel on on water infrastructure. Um, so, one second. Having slight technical difficulties here. Um, so it's uh, the Duke and DC event, Infrastructure Priorities, water, Water's Role in Promoting Equitable Planning and Investment. Uh, this is the last event in Duke's, Duke and DC's Beyond Talking Point series on environmental justice. And so today's conversation is going to talk about water, water equity, and water, water equity, and what we can do with the current infrastructure plan, infrastructure, plan, infrastructure investment, and futures relating to energy and global health. Um, so. As I said, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm an incoming professor in the Duke's uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And our panelists today include Catherine Flowers, an environmental health advocate, 2020 MacArthur Fellow and Franklin Humanities Institute practitioner in residence at Duke University. Martin Doyle, the director of water policy program at Duke Nichols Envi Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. And Greg Gershany, the executive director of the energy environment programs at the Aspen Institute. Um, so welcome all, welcome to all of our audience in DC. Uh, the first question I really wanted to kind of get started with um, this is that uh, as an engineer and in engineering panels like uh, one I actually attended last week, uh, hosted by the National Water Resource Institute and the Orange County Water District, the common refrain is that the technology exists, but the political will is not there when it comes to discussing water and wastewater treatment. Um, and so to all of the panelists, really, how true is that? Well, I'll jump in and answer it first. Just being on the ground as, as a person working with communities that are impacted by failed infrastructure, uh, uh, I don't believe that the technology exists to deal with climate change. I think that when, when the technology was developed, it did not take into account climate change, nor just release a report saying it's going to be drier in the West and wetter in the East, and where you have sunny day flooding, uh, like in Miami, in those areas, even in, the, in North Carolina, uh, people have reached out to us because they're, they're experiencing sunny day flooding. When they look at it, they see human feces. Uh, we're hearing, initially I was hearing from people talking about failing uh, wastewater technologies that were poor, because I work in poor, community, poor rural communities, but now I'm starting to hear from people in urban communities with the same problem. I'm actually engaged in a year long project with The Guardian. Uh, where we're actually documenting wastewater problems across the U.S. because there's no central database that, that collects that data. And we're finding that a lot of the technologies are failing. One of them, I think, is because of climate change. And I think the other one is sanitation equity because the cheaper technology was generally placed in the poor communities and they are not resilient. Do we have the technologies? That's another question. We'll talk about that when we talk about solutions a little bit later. But I don't think that those, if those technologies are available, they have not been available to the communities that need them. Yeah, and picking up on where Catherine kind of jumped right in, I, the, I think at one of the very first Aspen Nicholas events that we had on water, uh, someone said, um, we can treat any quality of water to any quality standard we want, given enough money and given enough energy. Um, and so I think that there's uh, the technology exists to do amazing things with water, to clean it, to move it, to pump it, to, uh, to do all these types of things. Um, but what it takes is both, like you said, Andrew, the political will, as well as a fairly large amount of water and energy, uh, or a, a large, fairly large amount of money and energy. Um, and uh, again, this gets to the equity issue where if the, if the finances, if the money is not there for particular communities, the technology may as well not even exist because it's just uh, it's not going to be available to them. I think Greg, Greg probably as well on this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, as Catherine talked about, like the technologies that we need for these issues around, uh, especially in the face of climate change, aren't there yet. And we'll talk more about that later. But we, when we think about 
research and development for these technologies, we need to think about not just what we need now, but what we need 10 years from now or 20 years from now, because when we install these technologies, they're gonna last for decades in some cases. And so we've got to really be thinking ahead, not just the next couple of years. And it's also, you know, I think for a lot of people who have clean drinking water, who have sanitation, it's really easy to forget that there's a lot of people within in the US that don't have access to those things. And there's a lot of people around the world. And so as we deploy these new technologies um, in the US to more communities, it, it helps drive down the price of those technologies, which then allow more and more communities to, to um, be able to, to build them. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so thank you all for those answers. And Greg, actually, uh, to, to your point of, okay, we install these systems so that they last for 10, 20, hundreds of years even. Um, so we have systems in place where you have pipe that was laid down um, 100 years ago and a city that might be actually replacing that at one mile per year. So um, if you have 100 miles of pipe, it's going to take you 100 years and you're going to be basically back at square zero. And so um, one of the things that I like to think about with as a potential solution to this is a, a water smart grid, um, kind of that distributed, a distributed generation, distributed treatment and distributed storage of water. Um, and the technology, of course, doesn't really exist for that yet. Um, but as we think about kind of an intersection between the electrical smart grid and some of the points that Catherine was bringing up of, um, well, it's impossible to install um, solar panels in certain cities. Um, is, is there really a... Um, it, can we learn from the failures of energy equity um, and imply those to water equity? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if we're not learning lessons from other sectors that are that have gone through this first, you know, so my, my program, we work on energy, we work on transportation, we work on industrial, we work on water, we do a lot of different things. And so it's um, when we're from from the point of view that we take, it's really easy to say, like, you know, these are the conversations we were happen, ha having with the clean electricity groups that we were pulling together three, four or five years ago about deploying solar, deploying wind, um, storage, things like that, and how we have to drive the cost down. Um, and, and now we're having those in water. We're having those with our um, colleagues that work on agriculture and food production. And so we have to take those lessons and apply them here. I think the it, you know the industrial revolution, not to go too far back, but like led to this centralization of uh, creation of power, creation of, um, you know, clean water, sanitation. And I think for the last decade or two, and it's accelerating, we're heading back to a more distributed model that's going to end up being less expensive in the long run, and it's going to give more people access to the technologies um, as we're able to kind of miniaturize these technologies. We don't have to build a giant sanitation plant. We can have you know, a technology that goes in the size of a closet that can that can do these things within a house or an apartment building um, that allow more people access to it and reduces the amount of infrastructure that we need to build um, because, you know, at the further out you are in a rural area, the higher the cost is because you have to get there. Um, you mentioned, you know, some of the Northeast cities that are replacing their water pipes. I mean, there's some cities that, a lot of cities that have lead pipes. I'm in DC and a lot of the lead pipes have already been replaced here, but there's cities with wooden pipes that are from two centuries ago that um, are still in the process of being replaced. And, and, and I think too, we, we have to add that uh, a lot of the, the sanitation inequity is because of historical, uh, his, historical discrimination. I mean, we have to look at racial covenant built sanitation where there were people of color or poor communities. Uh, I was recently doing, uh, I recently did a panel with a group from uh, a legal aid society in a, in, a, in a southeastern state that talked about how they, when they built the wastewater infrastructure in this major area, that they excluded the areas that have, um, where people are still on septic tanks and, and well water. And this is in a major metropolitan area even here in Montgomery, Alabama, where I am today, uh, there are people here on septic tanks that are failing. I was called out recently to the home of a woman whose septic system had failed because the sewage was coming back into her home, but only to find out that in the city of Montgomery, there are still people that are on 
uh, septic tanks. And the people that are on septic tanks are, these are black communities. These are historical racial covenants and the, the water and sewer authority, their position is, well, we, the developers should have built the, the, the sanitation systems when they put them in. But if we go back and look at history developers, when they built those communities, one of them is a historic community called Madison Park. Actually, one of the person who's the director of uh, the Aspen Institute, Eric Motley, his family is from Madison Park. They're still on septic tanks and they've been fighting them for years, but they're within the city in a wastewater treatment fee that is a flat fee, uh, water and, and, and sewer fee, which is a flat fee, but they're denied access to wastewater. So part of this, we got to deal with the environmental justice and the racial inequities that have been baked into the system that even when the money is available, even when the technology is available, some communities are being excluded, be they communities of color, be they poor communities in Appalachia. I've talked to people in Martin County, Kentucky, dealing with the same problem. They're white people that are in the colonias, uh, the people that are in uh, the Central Valley of California and, and certainly on um, a lot of the indigenous communities around the US, Puerto Rico and Alaska are having issues with this. So we got to deal with these gaps because without dealing with these gaps, we're going to still have these public health issues and we're going to still have people that are left behind when it comes to water and sanitation. That actually leads, leads me to a, a great question on um kind of coordination between um, between different agencies between of, of the government. So when we think about um, kind of the health aspects that you were just mentioning, Catherine, that we do have large disparities in health, um, largely due to water issues. Um, is, there, is there really a need for more coordination uh, between, let's say, Health and Human Services, the EPA, um, the USGS, Department of Interior? And what, what might that look like? Um, yeah, I'll take a, a crack at this real quick. Um, I think that there's the there's cross agency or cross topic at the federal level, but then also between the federal and the states. And I think that this is where things um, that there's these multiple dimensions. Um, good old federalism is always going to come back and bite us. Um, but I think um, there's traditionally the way we've thought about water has been that it's the purview of Department of Interior, maybe the Corps of Engineers, and EPA. Uh, with climate change, obviously uh, commerce and uh, NOAA is coming in more and more. Um, but on these issues related to, especially when health comes in, um, HUD becomes a, a very significant player. Um, Department of Health and Human Services um, is, is who it looks like the routing of water affordability money from the Biden administration is going to come through HHS instead of through EPA. And so, um, you know, water kind of permeates into all of these different types of uh, programs and decisions. And so the, the agency becomes relevant. But I think one of the other uh, big factors is that in the end, water is local. I mean, we're talking about septic tanks. We're talking about indi you know, an individual neighborhood is very different from the neighborhood immediately adjacent to it. Um, and the reality is the vast majority of money comes from state and local governments for water. Um, the federal government is financially a relatively, it, it's, a, it's a player, but it's not one of the bigger players. So we, we can't just talk a push on the federal government to do some coordination. That level of coordination and integrated thinking and act activity needs to actually really permeate down into the state agencies and even into the counties as well of how are these counties actually gonna start working across agencies. Uh, I, I like to jump in on that one because I know that one quite well too, especially from the other end of it. Um, what we're seeing, you know, again, uh, I guess because I'm an environmental justice advocate, I get to hear some things that may not, you know, when, when the problems happen, the community comes to us. I think part of the coordination is including the communities too. And what is happening is that people are making decisions who've never been to these communities or they just rely on the politicians who are in some cases, they speak out against what's going on, they get punished by being cited by regulators who are oftentimes in cahoots with folk that are part of the problem. I've just got a call from people in Uniontown, Alabama, for an example. In Uniontown, Alabama, a, 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 an engineering firm got the, got the rights to build a, a system that the local community say has failed. They just got money to build a, an additional system and the community spoke out against it. And even some of the elected officials were against it. They went to court to, to force the city to get out of the way. Why can you 
how do you put in place something that they have to maintain and force them to take it when they know this engineering firm has failed, but because of the, 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 the access that they have, they're being forced to still deal with the same thing over and over and over again. So uh, I, I was told in that particular case, an official from um, the federal agency actually visited the, the town and said that you got to sign these documents. If you don't sign the documents, you won't get anything with this because they didn't want that particular engineering firm. And then the same thing is happening in the town of Whitehall, Alabama, where uh, they're building a sewers lagoon next to an elementary school. Now, the reason I got the MacArthur Fellowship was because we found evidence of hookworm and other tropical parasites uh, in Lowndes County. Why would one build a sewage lagoon when in the town of Hamer, which is the county seat that already has a sewage lagoon, Miss Charlie May still has sewage running back into her house from the lagoon. And it's been reported on national and international news and it has not changed. So I think part of it is the community themselves, the residents that are living in these areas are left out of the decision-making process. And we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And we will never have equity until we have community engagement be part of that. Because the government officials oftentimes that are making decisions don't live in the community and don't have to suffer from the wrong decisions that they make. And um, to kind of echo what Catherine and what Martin said, I think that there's a lot that, you know, both across the federal government and the relationships between the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, and most importantly, the people living in communities, um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. I think that there's, um, you know, the Biden administration has appointed some really good people to roles within the water space, but I think it needs to be expanded. I mean, the the HHS has to be part of these conversations, like Martin said, HUD has to be part of these conversations. The Army Corps of Engineers, you know, um, is critical to a lot of the infrastructure build out that's been happening and that will happen. And if they're not talking to each other and then talking to the communities where they're, uh, who they're working with, then they're, you know, like Catherine said, they're, you know, they're going to build the, the wrong thing in the wrong place. They're going to build things that the community doesn't need and skip over things that the community does need. And so I think there's a lot of coordination there that needs to be had. I mean, something, you know, something similar to the climate office within the White House that Gina McCarthy runs would be a great thing to see for the water sector as somebody who, you know, somebody who is really in charge of that whole piece of it and works across kind of at a cabinet level. Um, but I don't, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Yeah. Thank, thank you all very much for those, those points of kind of, th there's both a top down, top need for top down communication. So from the federal government downwards, but also from the bottom up communication that that that's really nece necessary in order to make solutions that actually work for the people that, well, those solutions are intended for. Um, and kind of on that same communication level on the same kind of failures of, of federal governments or failures of state governments or failures of local governments. Um, I wanna kind of draw us back to the Flint water crisis. I know we've had multiple water crises since, but um, in the Flint water crisis, um, there was an incident where uh, General Motors was actually requested that they get off of Flint water and put back onto Detroit water, which is what they originally were on because they noticed that um, their, their water quality was deteriorating. And so when we think about either top down or bottom up, how do we really ensure that the water given to our citizens is at least as safe as the water that we give to our products? I think that's a value question. <laughs> uh, I think that what, what is happening is that we value profit over, over people. And, and until we shift that paradigm, we're gonna to continue to have those, those, those types of problems. But, but I think the other part of it is that citizens have to be engaged. Uh, citizens have to, we have to, to really uh, make our voices heard and have an impact, to have an impact on the policies that are put in place. Because even when uh, the political figures change, the policies are still there. And if the policies are based on inequities, we continue to have the same problem over and over and over again. And it goes back to what I said earlier, if we're gonna look at environmental justice, one of the principles of environmental justice is that you have to let the people speak for themselves. And the second principle is do no harm. So, you know, I think as part of all of that, uh, one of the things that the Biden administration has done that I'll give it credit for is, is that it has looked at uh, 
all of these issues through, a lens, through an equity lens in the White House, where they've made uh, environmental justice a principal part of that and is looking at all of the agencies that have to apply that because until we do that, then we're gonna to continue to have crises like what happened in, in Flint and what is happening in Lowndes County and other places around the country because of uh, the lack of looking at it through equity because some people think, some people are making decisions as in some of the conversations I've had recently where the people say, well, if any federal money comes here, we're gonna keep them on septic tanks. And, and, and disavowing the fact that people, first of all, are paying a wastewater fee in this flat rate. And then the second problem is that they're failing. That's the reason why people, that's another reason to get them off of these septic systems when there is a working sewer system that is already here. And the people, and it is so obvious, that's where federalism does come in, Martin, and should come into play. Because in the South, there was never really any real change as became, as it, when it came to equity, unless the federal government did get involved, you know, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama, <laughs> you know, so my, and I grew up in Lowndes County, which is between Selma and Montgomery. And when we look at voting rights and all the things that happened there without the federal government, the state government did absolutely nothing. And what we're seeing now is that there's a correlation between the people having the voice. That's why we see a lot of voter suppression laws coming into play now. And whether or not there's gonna be sanitation equity, it is all connected. And the only way we're going to change that, we're going to have to make sure that everybody has is, is, is able to participate in the democratic process so that we can have policies in place that will ensure the public health of all of us because it's detrimental. We saw this with COVID. We saw this with COVID when there were people that didn't want to wear masks, people that didn't want to socially distance, but it, it only happened. The only way we were able to get control of it is that we had to have some kind of guidance coming uh, that 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 was that showed that we were all impacted. And I guess when other folks started losing family members, because in Lowndes County, it had the highest per capita death and uh, an infection rate in the state of Alabama. This is a place where there's a lot of raw sewage on the ground. I could have told them that was going to happen. But when people like my neighbor, I live in Montgomery, my neighbor's uh, husband died and other people died, then people realized that COVID doesn't just affect poor people, it affects everybody. And then they started acting accordingly. And likewise, we gotta do the same thing when it comes to this, we gotta have equity, we gotta have access to the democratic process. And we have to change these policies in place that discriminate against people that are low wealth, people that are, are poor, uh, people that are uh, people of color women, et cetera, we have to change those policies. That's the only way we're gonna ensure that we don't have another Flint. Yeah. And I think that, um, just Go briefly, Indra, I think that one of the things on Flint that, um, th that we have to keep an eye on is the scary thing is that there's a lot of Flint out there. Um, we just, we know that Flint occurred and we probably, you know, the fact that the General Motors moved their water supply off of Flint's water um, should have been a pretty big red flag that uh, community leaders, um, including mayors and governors and such, uh, should have that should have been a big red flag for everybody. Um, and instead, they had to rely on uh, Mark Edwards, professor from Virginia Tech, going in and collecting uh, fundamental data in order, and then everything that kind of fell out of that. I mean, Flint's the extreme example where you had genuine criminal activity that that was rolled up into this. But I think. Um, picking up a little bit on what Catherine was saying, at, at some point, the community needs the information themselves um, in order to be able to advocate on their on their own behalf. Um, and one of the things that um, Greg, that Aspen and Nicholas have worked on through the years is this project called the Internet of Water, which is, um, it, we should be able this morning, I can, uh, I can Google the air traffic in Dublin right now, um, but I can't Google whether my water is actually safe to drink out of the tap. And it, it's just a very basic thing that we should have the, the public information about the quality of our water should be available at our fingertips on our cell phones. Um, and the fact that that's not the case is just, um, it's, it's a failure to bring the water system in the United States into the 21st century. Um, and so the, the, the struggle with water infrastructure is in one sense, we're talking about, you know, a Google for water and these big high tech kinds of things. And then in the same breath, we're talking about uh, pipes that we dig up that are made out of cedar logs, and we're talking about septic tanks in Lowndes County. And so it's these, these huge disparities of, uh, in water 
are 19th century technologies combined with 21st century technologies all in one water system in one place. And it, it just, it creates this, this massive wicked problem because of time and geography, technology, um, and, and all of that getting rolled up into inequities that, um, that have just, uh, that have been pervasive for decades. Yeah, actually, I guess I want to kind of step in, step in briefly on this as far as kind of giving giving water data to to the people um, kind of and try, try to dig out dig into that one a little bit more because uh, as Catherine was mentioning we have we, we need to be able to put the data and the science in the hands of the people so they can advocate for themselves um, Martin was kind of also alluding to this concept that we have kind of this this disparity between um, kind of two different sides of technology we have 21st century technology versus 18th century technology kind of operating in the same in the same bowl and the Safe Drinking Water Act was kind of supposed, it was supposed to fix that. It was supposed to, we mandated water reports and those water reports are supposed to be, they're supposed to come out every year. People are supposed to read them, understand them and be able to take them to their politicians and advocate for better water quality. But we know that they're failures. And so, yeah, I want to kind of toss that to both Martin and Greg and Catherine, kind of what can we do to improve that system? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, just, you know, kind of starting with what Martin was saying about the internet of water, you know, now, like today I can log on to the PJM uh, app on my phone and see what the electricity mix is for Washington DC. I can see what the electricity mix is in California and I can know, you know how much coal, how much natural gas, how much solar, how much wind is being used. And so that's a relatively new thing. Um, utilities used to release those on an annual basis and you could go dig through their annual report to find like what that mix is. And so I think the, you know, the access to the information is the critical thing here that allows people to be advocates for themselves and for their communities. And the more information people can have that's digestible, that is easily accessible, and that isn't hidden in 400 page government reports, um, the better off we are because then communities can act. Um, I mean, going back to Catherine's earlier point, my parents still have a, a septic system and a well because they live in a rural part of New Jersey. And so I think that this the issue here is is so widespread that, but most people who are working in the in the policy space who are making, you know, are not in places where this is happening, but are in places where there are sewage systems, where there is water, you know. And so I think that there's, um, there there is there the 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 people who are making the laws are not necessarily the people living in the communities, and I think that's that's kind of a very core basic thing that we need to to look at. I think the communication thing, Andrew, is really funny. Have you ever tried to read your uh, your water report, your CCR from your water utility? Um, there's a great group in DC uh, called Epic that uh, just did a kind of a crowdsource uh, thing where they they led a, an initiative to try to redesign the way information is presented in the CCRs. Um, I mean, my kids can read their cereal box and they do read their cereal box every morning. Um, so we figured out how to communicate basic information to the general public, but when you pick up information about your local water utility and the quality of your water, uh, number one, you get a report on the water that you have been drinking for the past year. So by then, you know, basically it's too late. And number two, it's presented in a way that's, I think, about at the level of reading of a journal article. Um, and so um, I get bored reading uh, journal articles, and so I imagine that a lot of people do as well. Um, so what we're communicating, how we're communicating, the things that we basically communicate about water. Um, if you wanted to design a system that was more intentionally opaque, it would be difficult to do so. I, I agree with both Greg and, and Martin. I think they, they raised some very good points. I think another part of that, when we go to sanitation, it's the same thing. There's no central database that one could go to and actually find out in all 50 states, uh, who has sanitation, who doesn't have sanitation, who has failed systems. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that uh, my organization, the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice is actually engaged in a year long project with the Guardian newspaper where we're trying to document these issues and we're asking people to self report. But we're also embarking upon a, a larger study where we have interns that will be actually collecting this information in all 50 states and hopefully can work with Martin and we can work together and talk about water and sanitation and have some type of 
uh, access or database where people, the community can go and see what's there and also be able to map this because we're talking about solutions, but we don't really understand the problem yet because there has been no central collection of data. Um, one of my roles um, with the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council is that we're building an equity tool. And part of it is used looking at data. And a lot of the data that we really need uh, or the, it's just simply not available. But I think that that's where the academic community comes in and can work with uh, citizens in the community to collect the data. And that's what the community engagement is needed in terms of citizen science and, and, and combining. Because again, with us working uh, to do the parasite study. It was the local community. When the doctor came in from Baylor to collect samples, people would not receive him. I actually had to tell him, go back to your hotel room because they're not gonna talk to you. And we collected the samples because the people knew us. And consequently, we were able to gather this information. And likewise, um, recently I was, I was contacted by someone from the University of Pittsburgh because EPA had reached out to them to do um, to put together a, a, uh, a curriculum on training local folk in Louisiana and this part of Louisiana who had an aerobic system that had failed uh, to train them on maintenance and the people were resisting them. And I said, okay, so you went to EPA, at what point are you gonna get the community involved? I said, you're gonna go in and tell them that they're stupid, they don't know how to operate this system, but you haven't asked them what the problem is. And they said, they they did not, the community was not engaged. I said, but you bring the community in on the back end, there's no buy-in. That's why they're resisting you. So consequently, I think we have to redesign how we do, how we gather data to also include people that are, that are on the ground because we'll get more accurate data when we do it that way. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a, an environmental justice piece to that. I was um, just talking to a colleague of mine about how when we think about trying to collect data on water quality that a small part of the, or a non-significant, a non-insignificant part of the population that we're trying to collect water data on um, might have different interactions with law enforcement, um, whether they're um, immigrant, non, depending on their immigration status or other status, they might not really want to inter interact with um, any officials of the government. And so subsequently, if we're trying to really map out water quality, if we try to give sensors to everyone, let's say that if that was the solution then some people may, may be resistant to that idea um, because of those interactions. But I, I wanna also throw in that in a place like Alabama, you know, if you have a failing septic system or none at all, the people are criminalized. So that's another reason to make people to go underground and not wanna, not wanna reveal that they are, are in this situation because they know that if so, they potentially will come in contact with law enforcement. We know how a lot of people feel about that because the news has not been good <laughs> nationwide. I mean, it's just a year ago that we were commemorating the life of George Floyd, who was, you know, that this, these, these things are very, very real. And we have to keep that in mind. But I think it goes back to why it's important for those of us that are in these sectors working to work with people in the community and, and learn community engagement, because that's the only way we're going to be able to influence the policy that will bring about the equity that we're talking about now in the water space. Yeah, so that actually leads to our, our first question from the audience. Uh, when it comes to decision making and community engagement, how do we make this an issue that is able to get on the ballot so that folks can be aware and vote on these issues, right? How do, um, should these issues be voted on in communities? I assume that's, that's more of a yes. Um, but really, how do we make sure that um, people, that we get people living in communities most impacted by water to actually make and address policies that impact them? Um, well, I think that, you know, one uh, historic, well, the, the easiest thing to do is to get Catherine Flowers involved. Um, and so she'll get the issue, she'll get it a uh, high profile and she'll get it going. But um, I think that there's one of the contexts of this historically has been that it was almost an unspoken goal of water utilities through much of the 20th century to be unnoticed. Um, they were part of public works department. They did their job. They, they had, they did their thing. And it was only really a combination of a couple things, um, big systemic failures, um, whether it's Flint, whether it's the DC uh, lead water crisis, Jackson, Mississippi, some of these others that have started to make people aware of the fact that they have a water utility in the first place. Um, um, and then the second thing is you have a couple of people who have done an amazing job of actually drawing attention intentionally 
to the fact that people get their water from a water utility. And I'd say that George Hawkins, who ran DC Water for, uh, for a number of years, is really one of the people who drew attention to the fact that the most important thing that you bring into your home is water. And so the, this, this water utility gives you um, an amazing amount of water, amazing amount of sewer services um, for, for a lot of people at a rate that's very, very cheap. Um, and then I, I think that getting that attention was something that George did very strategically because he wanted the water utility, the water services, to be something that people were aware existed and that they actually started to vote because of that, vote, vote on topics because of that. Um, now, granted, that, that carves off large chunks of the population that either don't have a water utility, don't have those kinds of water services. Um, and it also, now we're starting to become increasingly recognizing of the fact that there's a large portion of the population that actually, even within those water utilities, don't have affordable water services in the first place, that they're spending, you know, one, two, three, or let's say five, six, seven, eight percent of their monthly income just on their water bill. Um, and so that really doesn't, that's, that's not affordable water. Um, but that'd be my first uh, take of that question. Well, I, I'm going to jump in there. Uh, I, I just think that one of the things I think that has brought attention to water and the, the, the importance of water was Standing Rock. Uh, and, and one of the things that came out of Standing Rock was the, uh, Win Winnie Machoni, which is water is life. And a lot of uh, the young people that, that were there that are now engaged in the environmental movement, the green movement, et cetera, uh, are, are carrying that forward. And what we're seeing a lot of fights now around the fossil fuel infrastructure is also dealing with water in West Memphis right now. There's a fight uh, over the Bahalia pipeline that they wanna take through a water source for a million people. So, you know, that, that's part of the issue too. And I think that what it's doing in that area and people that are paying attention to that is that it's making more people realize the importance of policy in those decisions. But in some cases, what is happening in places like uh, in Louisiana, uh, in Cancer Alley, they're taking away a lot of the decisions from the local people. And, and the decisions are being made outside of the community in terms of where these issues are being cited. So I think that ultimately it's gonna have an impact. I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, but I work around a lot of lawyers, but I, I think that, that ultimately taking away democracy from these communities to have a right to choose is also a, a factor. And here and, and I'm finding throughout in some of these areas too that um, where water was a part of the public utilities and they're now becoming private entities that's more interested in profit. And by the time people know about it, it's too late. And, and I'll jump in and just say, I think, you know, having the water conversation be part of the climate conversation is gonna be really beneficial to getting things done in the water space. Um, you know, since 2018, the climate conversation has really taken on a different tone and a different trajectory than it had the 30 plus years before that. And things have really changed. And so seeing water as part of that, access to drinking water, access to sanitation in the US, around the world, and the interdependencies between water and, uh, and energy, um, both you need water to create electricity, you need electricity to move water, you have um, things like, uh, you know, um, Catherine is referring to some of the pipeline issues, like there's the Michigan uh, pipeline that's, you know, there's a lot of uh, consternation about it going under the water supply for most of Northern Michigan. And so um, I think that these, th this, this is gonna bring it to the forefront for voters more than it has previously. Voters are, all, all, are always gonna think about the things that most impact them. And so, you know, health, jobs, the economy, things like that are always gonna be at the top of the list, but hopefully the water that comes into their houses and their apartments, the energy that come, you know, is also gonna be um, up, on the, up, up, up towards the top of that list too. I guess link, linking off of that one, um, I, I wanna kind of think about the, uh, there's an act that's, that's currently um, in discussion, the Innovation and Comp Competition Act of 2021. Um, in that act, water is mentioned 36 times. Um, it's split mostly between navigable waters in the Indo-Pacific, uh, safe drinking water for that same region, so the Indo-Pacific as well, um, and a couple other things. Um, but there's really no link, mention of the link in between chip manufacturing and high water usage um, or the heavy metals used in chip manufacturing, right? So this, this concept that we've been talking about of uh, where we site and where we move 
um, certain parts of energy or certain parts of products um, that we don't really link those to we link we take the economy but we don't link the, to the water usage um, there and so um, how can we make that another part of the conversation that when we start talking about the economy we talk about jobs when we talk about manufacturing when we talk about energy how do we make sure that people are also aware that that actually still does have a link with their drinking water yeah i think i'll just do a quick thing on the chip manufacturing um the the reality is that um we keep hoping that big corporations and big manuf manufacturing facilities will make water-based locational decisions that they'll move to areas that have sustainable water um, the two as, as far as i can recall the two biggest investments in chip manufacturing um, one was i think tsc and the other one uh, was intel and intel is going to put 20 billion dollars into two manufacturing plants based in arizona and tsc is going to put 12 billion dollars into a chip manufacturing place again in arizona um, i it's you know, of the regions of the United States with uh, water challenges on the horizon, if not right now, um, the Colorado Basin, including Arizona, is one of the more significant ones that's sitting there. So um, Arizona is a little bit strange. It's got some really good water from the Salt River Project, um, so it does have some water security. But when major investments uh, on something as central to um, uh, uh, to our economy as well as our national security as chip manufacturing is being placed in uh, somewhere like Arizona that clearly has water challenges um, that really does start to raise questions about um, are we putting ourselves in a position where water security and national security are truly intertwined because of a locational decision of a chip manufacturer. Um, so um, I, I hear companies say that they, they want to be water sustainable and that they want to make locational decisions based on water, but I just don't actually see the evidence in their final decisions being made. Yeah, I think if we think, if we think about it from a, even from a federal government perspective, having something similar to a, a, a decent database where people can kind of go and analyze, okay, this is going to be the impact of a pipeline on my drinking water source. If I can look up where my drinking water source is, um, that that might allow someone to say, well, maybe I should vote against giving subsidies to a manufacturing company that's going to locate itself here, or giving subsidies to an energy pipeline that's running through here, if they know how well that's intertwined, intertwined with their water, or that it might actually be beneficial to have it. It's, it's though those questions need to, the information needs to be there in order for people to really get those questions at, um, out there and answered. And also, Andrew, I like to add that, that, uh, you know, as a, as a teacher, you know, I, I taught in middle and high school. I think that people should know where their water sheds are. <laughs> they should know where their water comes from. Most people don't know. They just think they turn on the water and it automatically appears. But I think the more that we know and the more we educated about it, the more informed our decision making can be. And, and also, people can start asking questions when they wrap this thing up in a bow and say that, oh, it's going to create all these jobs, but what is the long-term impact going to be? Uh, I've read stories about people buying houses in parts of Arizona, to Martin's uh, comment, where they have turned on the tap and there's no water coming out. Uh, but there are, there are issues that, because water is, you know, unless it's, there's a flood or we're enjoying it for recreational purposes, I think we don't think about uh, water in that way. We're starting to change the way we think about it, but I think we also need to incorporate in our educational system. If you, if I live in Alabama, I need to know what watershed I'm a part of, and I need to understand uh, how what I do to the water affects the people down in Mobile and other areas. So those things are not being taught anymore. I, I think I just came through the educational system at a time when we were teaching geography and we did teach those kinds of things. And for some reason, it hasn't been emphasized as much anymore. And I think if you ask the average person on the street, uh, where does your water come from? They would tell you it comes from a tap and they can't go any further than that. But I think that that's one way in which we can, can realize the importance of it and then make good policy about how to preserve it because water, as we can see, I mean, we, we've seen the examples in South Africa, where there was a major city there that was running out of water. I mean, that is not too far in the future for some of us if we do not do it differently from the way we've been doing it all along. Yeah, I, I, you have a really great point with the that education piece. I, I can think about my own 
um, experience as a high school student. When I first, when I first finally, I guess, graduated to being 18 and was able to vote, one of the things that we were voting on um, in the city I grew up in, it was Tallahassee, Florida, was uh, members of the Appalachian Cola Water Board. Uh, I did not realize that the Appalachian Cola Water Board controlled kind of that intersection between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. That I was sitting right there, that that was that really important thing. I now kind of regret how uninformed I was in that vote um, in Leon County. I was like, I, I had no idea. Um, and, and I did consider myself a fairly educated 18 year old at the time. I wound up getting into IT for undergrad, but like I had no idea that that was that important of a role. Um, I guess, um, let's see. So we have about 13 minutes or so left. Uh, we have one question from the audience um, that I want to pull up. Um, it's actually related to a point we were talking about, I guess, maybe two or three topics ago. Uh, but what role do you see in community project funding in Congress playing in improving access to water in the future? Right? Will it become the main source of federal aid and assistance for poor rural communities who cannot afford water improvement projects through state and local funds alone? Well, I can, I can speak to some of that. I, I know through the American Jobs Plan uh, that they are proposing $111 billion to deal with water and sanitation and, 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 with a, and targeting rural communities, which has not happened before. I also know that there are, there are some, um, there, there's proposed legislation to deal with um, making sure that people in rural communities have access to, to monies to put in place at least on-site septic if it's available. But one of the things that I'm pushing for um, is not only just giving people money, but making sure that the infrastructure that the money is spent on works and that there are warranty service warranties that come along with this. Because one of the things that we found out, at least on the sanitation end of it, that these on-site systems, once they are put in, that there is the liability is transferred to the residents. And I don't know of no product that anyone spends $15,000 or more on that does not come with a service warranty. I wouldn't buy a product in my home that didn't come with a service warranty. So that's one of the things that we're pushing for. But the American Jobs Plan, I think the big picture is that there are, um, there, they have heard us uh, because I've been talking about waste and sanitation for 20 years, but they have heard us and they're listening and they're trying to make sure that there's, there's uh, water and, and sanitation infrastructure in, uh, in rural communities because a lot of them have been left out. And we're talking about, you know, we've been talking about Flint and the urban areas, but there's still some places in rural communities where people uh, they, they have, they're using well water, they have their own wells. So we have to make sure that those people too, who are taxpayers, that there should be some type of assistance that provided to them to make sure that they also have clean water that is not contaminated and certainly not contaminated, not only by septic tanks, but also by industry, because that has been happening a lot too. Yeah, this one, um, uh, the, the rural communities is a super tricky one. Um, I, I don't have as good of a command on that one. And so I've got to defer to people like Catherine and um, the USDA programs as well. Um, to be completely honest, the community project funding approach really makes me nervous um, in, in that it's, uh, what I saw during my time in federal government was um, going in and working with communities, coming up with a financing plan that they would be able to get financing, come up with a repayment program uh, kind of an approach. And then in the end, if there's a project or a program like a community project funding, uh, what I saw was the community's response in the end would be, you know, I remember the quote is, I, I think I'll just roll my dice with Congress. Um, that is rather than kind of going through and pushing it through themselves and working through kind of the local projects and programs and doing some of their own local finance that they, are willing and uh, for good reason in, in some cases to actually try to push it through of getting a grant from the federal government. Um, and then I think the more systemic problem is that the scale of infrastructure needed is much greater than the scale of funding through the community project funding. And so these, these may address individual communities, individual projects and, and programs that are needed but the, the scale of the problem dwarfs the amount of funding that's actually moving through the system. And I'd say that this applies to the infrastructure bill as well. The amount of money that we need in US water infrastructure is much, much greater than um, the portion of the infrastructure package that's moving through Congress right now. 
Um, so the problem's just too big for, for what we're talking about. And we've really got to start to think about more systemic, uh, addressing the system rather than these individual types of, of gap filling types of approaches. Yeah, just a, a quick response on that is I think, I mean, it, this, it, the, what's in the, the infrastructure bill now, what, you know, where it ends up, we'll, we'll see. But um, I think it's a good start and it'll help um, hopefully shorten the, the time frame that um, utilities are replacing pipes or replacing infrastructure, things like that to kind of get caught up on the backlog um, of the infrastructure build out. Most of the money is still going to come from local and state levels and from, from ratepayers. Um, but I do think to Martin's point, you know, there I think there's ways that the federal government can make it easier for communities to access. A lot of the communities don't have specialists that can do these grant applications. You know, it's it's a small team that's doing this. And so I think, you know, creating some kind of customer service center um, for infrastructure within the federal government could be a really um important thing to make sure that communities have access to this money in the easiest way possible to make sure that the things actually get built in the places that need it the most. That, that actually kind of, kind of piggybacks uh, well onto, onto another question that I, I had. Um, and some of, it's a point that's kind of underlined a few other talks, comments that we've made. Um, what, what role might, um, Kind of this water financing, the privatization of certain water utilities. What what role might that play in provide? What role could that play, or how could we envision that from a from a federal government standpoint? How could we envision setting up a system that would be equitable as far as distributing finances from private industry into local water treatment, local wastewater treatment, distributed water treatment into rural communities? Um, could we envision that in a in an equitable manner? That's a good question. I think we need to see it being modeled first. I think that there are people in Flint, for an example, that when they hear privatization there, you know, they get scared because of what their experience has not been a good one. And then I'm also seeing in other places where we're fighting uh, for equitable access that people have used uh, language to exclude folk that have been excluded for a very long time because of, you know, through historical inequities and sometimes just flat out racism. And I like to also go back to the point about um, financing. I mean, poor communities can't pay back loans. So we have to come up with a way, do we exclude, and that's what has happened. Do we continue to exclude those communities that have no tax base? Do we continue to exclude those communities that, that don't have the capacity to pay the money back? Are they entitled to water and sanitation too? And then that comes to the question of the human right to water and sanitation, which is part of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that we want to eliminate poverty. So, uh, it, it opens the door to a whole lot of questions in terms of our approach and what paradigms are currently used. And I like to quickly, but my last point in terms of solutions, I think that we have to change the paradigm in terms of how we do things. And when we talk about solutions, generally the people that are sitting there trying to find out what those solutions are are not the people that are suffering from the problems. I think they should be sitting at the table too. And we need to change that paradigm. Even when it comes to engineering, I think that the people that are suffering with the problems can help us find the solutions to how to treat wastewater better. And, and generally they're not sitting at, sitting at the table. They're actually the ones that have to have a buy-in after these things have been created and could it help us avoid a lot of the mistakes that we make. So through our organization, the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice, we plan to partner with some of the best engineers and, and scientists in the country to come up with solutions. And one of the things that we're looking at is how they treat wastewater and outer space. I think if we can combine people from rural communities like Lowndes County who are keeping tractors running that are 40 years old and people from NASA, we can come up with a way to treat wastewater that's efficient and that can be affordable and available to everybody and something that you can go to a Lowe's or Home Depot and buy. And that's what we're gonna be working on. Um, I'll make my last comment here, Andrew, and then uh, maybe let Greg do it. Um, I, the the rural side is beyond me, to be honest. I, I the the solution set there is just it's just an unbelievable challenge that people like Catherine are really trying to dig into, and I just don't. I, I I've um, I just have no idea. On the urban side, I think that one thing that we can maybe start pushing uh, is 
that rating agencies or investors actually start to ask questions about the when a bond is issued from a city that the rating agencies and the investors actually ask for more information about the about equity and justice issues in the disclosing documents. They should ask how much of the revenue is coming from this portion of the population versus that portion of the population. How much of the revenue for this uh, municipal bond, uh, how much of the revenue is actually coming from fees and fines? Um, if you go back and look at the disclosure documents from the city of Jefferson, Missouri before the protest there, turns out that the general revenue from Jefferson, Missouri was getting 20% of its revenue from fees and fines. That's totally unsustainable. And that means that 20% of the city's revenue was coming from the uh, low income, predominantly black portion of the population in the city as well. So um, I, I think we need in the, in the urban side, when we're using finance, we can and should expect more thoughtful decisions from the investors themselves. Um, they can drive at least information disclosure. They can actually potentially drive um, decision changes, um, but it means that actually uh, additional information is going to be needed. Um, so on the urban side, I think that we can start to move the needle a little bit. On the rural side, I think that uh, things like grants are going to have to be needed for the situation that we're in now. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just, you know, to Catherine's point about, um, you know, thinking innovatively about the things that we're gonna need, going back to the research and the development and accessing things like NASA, who a lot of the stuff that we use today, you know, are the cameras on our smartphones, which you can't see, you know, are from based off of technology that NASA have been working on for decades. And so um, thinking, forward thinking research policy, you know, from Congress, from the administration, from private companies about how we can take this into the water sector um, and just thinking, I hate the phrase, but outside of the box of, you know, kind of what we've been doing for the last hundred years, um, I think is really critical because if we're headed in a more distributed, more innovative, more individualized um, system, then we need to think differently than we have um, in the past. And that way we can get things into the hands of people in rural areas, into the hands of people in urban areas, and into the hands of people outside of the U.S. Um, who need this just as much or more than, than we do here. Yeah, I think, um, but before I close out, I, I guess I, I could add in a kind of my old experience in this, this, this panel kind of changed the way I thought about that experience. So I used to do research on microbial fuel cells, which we're seeing as a way of treating wastewater um, and producing energy at the same time in a carbon neutral sort of way. Um, and I looked at that and said, okay, that's, that was just a failed experiment, a failed amount of investment. Um, but that investment actually came out of um, the Naval Research Lab and the Navy's interest in being able to treat water remotely, right? If you are on a ship or if you are on a submarine, you can't treat your wastewater in the same way that we do um, on land. And so that was their interest. And so solutions that they were interested in would have also benefited rural communities. That's the way that I pitched my research was rural and um, developing countries. It was Those were the two aspects that that research targeted. And so if we think if we again try to think outside the box, if we think of other people that may benefit from these new technologies and these new creative technologies, we might be able to say, well, we can pull in a bunch of different people all in the room together to say we can create an innovative solution that might work for everyone and not just those in urban communities or those in rural communities that we can create these uh, slightly more universal or not universal solutions, but customizable solutions. Um, so um, with that, I would like to thank all of my panel. So I would like to thank uh, Martin Doyle, Greg Gershany, and Catherine Flowers. Um, this was a great discussion. As I said, it kind of made me look back on past experiences in a, in a better light. Um, and so thank you all very much. And